Hello there, and welcome back. I'm Martin, and today on Daddy Roll the One, we're going to be talking about an early D&D game mechanic commonly referred to as race as class. So what this means is, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, this is when you play your race as your class or vice versa. There's no mixing and matching of, of those two different dynamics. So as an example, you would play a dwarf, not a dwarf fighter. So this was a mechanic that was actually relatively common in certain versions of D&D all the way up until the release of third edition when Wizards of the Coast had taken over the brand from TSR. So today what we're going to be talking about is when specifically this mechanic or concept was introduced into the game and and then we're going to go through which versions of the game had that mechanic because as, as you recall from maybe some of my earlier videos there were two concurrent versions of D&D that were being published at the same time. And some of those versions included this idea of race as class, and some of them uh, did not. And then we're going to talk about why. Why was this mechanic created? And in the why section, we'll kind of deal with three different um, parts of that. One would be from a mechanics standpoint, one would be from a more lore standpoint, and then the third would be more from a legal standpoint. And at the end, we're going to talk about some pros and cons. So I know that this concept, if you've never heard this before, let's say you started with fifth edition, or even if you started with third edition, um, the idea that you're playing a class as your race can seem a little bit off-putting maybe because um, it's just something that you've never really encountered before. So again, I'm going to talk about what are some pros and cons of this approach. All right. So to start off, we need to talk about where did this idea come from? And to do that, um, so it did debut, I'll just tell you right up front, it debuts in this box set here, Moldvay Basic 1981. However, I need to talk a little bit about some of the versions of D&D that came before that to help you understand why I'm saying that it the concept you know, was solidified or codified, however you want to say it, in this version of the game. So 1974 is the release of original Dungeons and Dragons. And in the classes here, this book is not super well organized, but you see we have three different characters. So you have fighting men or, you know, let's just call them fighters. This fighting men is too clunky. And it says and includes the characters of elves and dwarves and even hobbits so halflings were originally called hobbits now by this point when this version of the game was published this is post the um, potential lawsuit from the Tolkien estate when tsr was supposed to have gone through and excised all the use of the words hobbit and, and replaced it with halfling uh but every once in a while you just come across one where they forgot so you know no computers back that in back then so you weren't doing like a find and replace type of thing this is all done manually so uh, fighting fighters are elves, dwarves, and hobbits. And then it says magic users includes only men and elves. So uh, this came up in the comments um, earlier, uh, where it also says like uh, clerics are limited to men only. And someone said like, why do they only allow men to play clerics? And this is you know a very antiquated way of talking. It's it's very like Tolkien esque. When they say men, they mean humanity. They mean humans. So magic users can be humans and elves and clerics are limited to being humans only. Okay. So those were the three classes in this game. So then when you get over here, uh, when you talk about dwarves, it says dwarves may opt only for the fighting class. Okay. So this is why I'm saying that technically this version is not racist class. It might seem like it and mechanically it works out the same because a dwarf at this point can only be a, a part of the fighting class. Okay. I'm going to skip elves really quick just to go to hobbits in the, or halflings and we'll come back. So see here it says halflings. Well, here it said hobbits, uh, but it says halflings. And then listen to this language because this is very specific and it's going to come up later. Should any player wish to be one, they will be limited to the fighting men class as a halfling. So fighters, and they can only progress to fourth level as a halfling. Okay, now elves. So awkwardly worded. Okay, there's still arguments about this today. Elves can begin as either fighting men or magic users and freely switch class whenever they choose from adventure to adventure, but not during the course of a single game. Okay, none of those terms are defined. What is What constitutes an adventure 
and what constitutes a single game. So is a single game a session or is that completing a scripted series of adventures that the dungeon master been it's like it's just it, it's the wording here just doesn't make sense and what it implies is it says they gain the benefits of both classes and can use both weaponry and spells and they can use magic armor and still act as magic users but it says that they switch class whenever they choose so it makes it sound that you can be a fighter on one adventure and then on the next adventure, you decide to be a magic user because you can't switch during the course of a single game. So you're technically, this would imply that you're not acting as both at the same time. You are choosing whether to be a fighter or a magic user at the start of an adventure. And then at the at the end of that game, you can choose to switch it again. Um, it's just the way it's worded. But the main point of this is that... Um, Elves were doing both fighting and magic use. Okay, so that's the original game. Okay, so a lot of people say, well, that's racist class because it's limited. It says fighters and, uh, you know, dwarves and, and hobbits can only be fighters and elves are fighter magic users. So kind of, but it's, it is saying that they can, they can opt for those classes. I know it's just, it's a wording thing. It's a semantics thing, but the reason that's important because as you get to this supplement, so this is 1975 supplement one. So this comes out just a year after this. And in this booklet, we have the introduction of a new class, Thieves. So it talks about Thieves, and then very specifically, it says down here, Dwarves, Elves, Half-Elves, or Hobbits. Again, this should have said Halfling because of when it was published, but it says Hobbits. Maybe Thieves. And in this class, there will be no limit to their continuing to advance to the highest levels. So once you add Supplement 1, Greyhawk, to original D&D, it is no longer race as class, okay? So, and it technically wasn't even here anyway, but that's neither here nor there. Supplement one is part of the game with the thief class. And because every um, non-human race can be a, a thief as well as whatever it said in here, that means that it's not race as class. Now we do have the introduction of a new race here or species, half elves, okay? But then as you come over here, Again, some more clunky wording. So dwarves, and it talks about dwarves. And here's where you get into like, e as soon as you get to this supplement, it's only a year later, you're starting to get this idea that ability scores are more important than implied in this book. So if you have higher ability scores, you can go to higher levels as a dwarf. If dwarf of, of strength 17 can go to seventh level and a strength 18 can go to eighth level. Okay. And then it says among the dwarves themselves, but never as a player, there are clerical types. So dwarves can be clerics as NPCs. Okay, and then it says they can work simultaneously as fighters and thieves. So here's where you get into multi-classing. Multi-classing doesn't exist in here unless you're talking about the elf who can work as a fighter or magic user, depending on what they have chosen for that specific adventure. Here it says dwarves can operate as fighters and thieves at the same time, but they don't get any bonuses, but blah, blah, blah. And it says they can only wear leather armor and they have to divide their experience always evenly, even when they can no longer progress in the fighter class. That was a huge kind of uh, trap for, for characters like this because they were unlimited as far as how, how uh, high of level they can go as a thief. This is their, uh, there's no limit to their continuing to advance to the highest levels in thief, but you know you're limited to max eight level as a fighter if you have a strength of 18. But once you pass that, you're still dividing your experience points. You're just dumping it into a class that you're no longer advancing in. That was a balancing factor. We can talk about that in a later video if you guys are interested in that. Okay, so then it says uh, elves and it talks about elves and what levels they can go up to in fighter as well as magic user. And uh, then it says among the elves themselves, same thing as dwarves, there are clerical types only as NPCs and they are multi-class fighter magic user cleric types. But then it says elven thieves work in all three categories at once. So all three, and then he has to say what that means, fighter, magic user, and thief. So that means if you want to be an elven thief, you are a multi-class fighter, magic user, thief, unless you opt to only be anything uh, th than a thief. So if you want to just be a thief, you can just be a thief and that's it. But you can't be a fighter thief or a magic user thief. If you want to be a multi-class thief, you have to be a multi-class fighter, magic user, thief, and then you're splitting your experience points, blah, 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 like we talked before. Okay, then it says hobbits can be either fighters or thieves, and as thieves, they have a better chance for doing things, but they can't be a multi-class fighter thief like the dwarf can. Then you get to half-elves 
some more clunky wording here. Half elves are half elven, half human. Okay, and then they can go up to different levels of different classes. Okay, it's one of my favorite parts of this whole book. Okay, there are no, it says half elf, there are no half elf clerics. For in this regard, their human side prevails. I never understood what that meant. Next sentence. However, half elves with a basic wisdom score of 13 or more may also become clerics. <laughs> there are no half elf clerics, but if you have a wisdom score of 13 or more, you can become a cleric. If they so opt, all experience will be divided in equal proportions between fighting, magic use, and clericism. So that's your option. If you want to be a half elf cleric, you are automatically a fighter, magic user, cleric. And like everybody else, you're dividing those experience points, even though um, you can only go up to fourth level as a cleric. Okay, but that um, is original D, D. So again, it's not racist class. The reason I spent so much time on this is because I just want people to understand that, especially once you add this supplement in, this is not a racist class game, even though this without the supplement kind of is close. Okay. Okay. Then in 1977, so two years after the release of the Greyhawk supplement and the introduction of the thief class, you have the publication of this box set. This is the basic Dungeons and Dragons game edited by Eric J. Holmes. We have talked about this before, but in general, uh, what this game is intended to do is to sort of simplify and reorganize and do some different layout to help explain how to play original D&D, so the original three books, and the Greyhawk supplement to a group of new players who don't have experience either playing war games or having had the benefit of playing with either uh, Gary Gygax or Dave Arneson. So a lot of the early players of the game, actually, they were coming from that Midwest area and they were playing in games with the founders. So a lot of the language that you saw earlier in that um, first book, the Men and Magic book from original Dungeons and Dragons, where it seems very unclear to us. Part of the reason for that is because Gary was writing that based on notes from Dave Arneson, but the assumption was a lot of them, they were writing things that they just knew people would know what they were talking about. Okay. So it's very difficult for us to understand without having been there. And it's even easier for us to understand from the standpoint that like we have 50 years of history almost to go on. So we kind of get what he was saying. But if you imagine being a player back then, you didn't really understand a lot of those terms, especially if you didn't have either a war game background or you hadn't been gaming with these guys. But they just wrote in such a way that was very casual and, and assumed that people would know what they were talking about. So anyway, they uh, TSR hires Eric Holmes. Uh, he, he actually writes to them and asks if he can help with this. And he edits this particular version of D&D that is intended, again, to sort of make it easier for new players to enter the game. And in this game, he does include the Thief class from uh, the Greyhawk supplement. So it has increased the number of available character classes from three to four. He eliminates the subclass of Paladin, which was introduced in Greyhawk, and any of the following things that had happened in the other supplements, the new classes and things that had happened. He also eliminates the half elf. So again, streamlining. He's trying to make this easier to understand and fewer options. Just is it's less to wrap your head around when you're trying to learn the mechanics of this game. So when he talks about the different characters, he specifically introduces the fighter class, or again, still called fighting man. And it says that, you know, any human can be a fighting man, but also all dwarves and halflings are members of the fighter class, unless they opt to be thieves. And then elves can be a combination of fighter and magic user. And it's explained there. So again, giving the option of a dwarf or halfling or later and elves to be thieves, that means that this is not a racist class game. OK, now it does explain that the rules for non-human thieves are going to be explained in advanced D&D. &D, and that's kind of like a little quirk to this version of the game. This is the only basic game that we would call basic D&D &D that's actually written to be used with advanced D&D, &D, which Gary was writing as this as this version of the game was being published. OK, so that's Holmes Basic 1977. Now, also 1977, you have the release of the Advanced D&D &D Monster Manual. And then in 1978, you have the release of the Player's Handbook for Advanced D&D. &D. So just very important to note, this is written by Gary Gygax. This is written by Gygax and Artisan. That is going to be important later. OK, but in this book, you have 
the description of the different player character classes and races. Okay, now we're starting to get closer to what you'd see, I guess, like in a fifth edition game. Uh, but you're seeing all the different classes that are available here, and then which race can be which class. Okay, so we've expanded our races. So we've added gnomes and half orcs in addition to bringing back the half elves from Greyhawk Supplement 1. Uh, we have a longer class list here, and it's telling you which race can be which class. So that was a thing back then. They were limited. So the dwarves, if you look at this, it's really no different than what you saw in the original game plus plus um, the Greyhawk supplement. So you have dwarves being fighters, thieves, and then they can also be assassins. And elves are the same, except they also add magic use. Okay, half elves can be a whole bunch of things. They can be clerics and druids, and they can be fighters, and they can be rangers, and they can be magic users, and they can be thieves, and they can be assassins. Halflings are limited to being fighters or thieves. They can't even be assassins. Okay. You've got your half orcs there, cleric, fighter, assassin, and thief. And then humans, of course, being everything which was the benefit of the human um, class. I'm sorry, the human race. The benefit of playing a human is that you can play any class. They were the only race that can do that. Now, this table, I never understood why they were on two separate tables because they should have just been condensed into one. This tells you how far you can advance in a particular class based on your race. And then all these footnotes are telling you how much higher you can go if you have higher level um, or higher ability scores, okay? But you see humans are unlimited. Again, the benefit of playing a human, you have unlimited advancement in any class that you want. They're the only species that does that, okay? Again, we talked about this earlier, but this in parentheses, that means there are NPC clerics, but not PC clerics, okay? And then halflings had NPC druids, all right? But that is the expansion of the class and race system that is going to be kind of, you know, blown out over time until we get to where we are with fifth edition, where any race can be any class. Now that started in third edition, actually, it's just, there were actually fewer options as far as race wise than there are in 5e. But the idea, uh, third edition was the first edition that changed that to say, doesn't matter what species you are, you can be like, anybody can be a paladin. In this game, only humans could be paladins as an example. Okay. So that's 1978. Now, we have talked a little bit about this before, but we're going to get into this basic set. So this is Mold Bay Basic 1981. This is another attempt to kind of um, make the rules simpler for people to understand, specifically for people ages 10 and up. And here we see in the class section, character classes. Most D&D characters will be humans. Okay, so this is a basic assumption of, of the game that I think a lot of people forget or overlook, but it specifically tells you, this is the rule book, that most characters will be human. That was the default assumption. Okay, a human can be a cleric fighter, magic user, thief. They're the most widespread of all the races. The human traits of curiosity, crazy resources, and help them to adapt, survive, prosper. Okay, and then it says some players may wish to have what they called at the time demi-human characters, which were elves, dwarves, and halflings. Okay, so those are your classes. So you have cleric, but then you see dwarf here. It doesn't say you're playing a dwarf fighter. It says you're playing a dwarf. It, there's nothing in here about playing a fighter. Okay, so it just talks about like, what do you need to do to be a dwarf? You have to have a strength score of 13 or greater to get a bonus on experience points. Okay, what are the restrictions? What hit dice they use? What kind of armor they can wear? Their maximum level limits? And then uh, their special abilities, so they have infravision and they can, you know, detect construction trips, all that kind of stuff. So all that stuff kind of started way early on in the game. Now, elves does say they they do talk about having the advantages of both fighters and magic users, but it doesn't say that you're playing a fighter or magic user. It just says you have the advantage of playing those. Again, I know this is semantics, but my point is these things they're not. There's no separation. If you look at the player's handbook from 1978. OK, there is a section on character races and then a section on character classes. That does not exist in this version of the game because there are there is no separation. There are character classes. You are a dwarf or an elf or a halfling. OK, there's your classic drawing there of, the, of all the different um, species and classes. OK, so um, that is. Moldvay Basic. Now, now we're going to talk about 
why? What are some potential reasons for why race as class was created in this version of the game? Okay, so why the move from the separation of race and class to consolidating it into just one particular option? Well, there's a few different reasons and ideas why this would happen. There's one real big one. Um, I'll just say right now, it's probably the legal reason. And we'll get to that later. But there are other reasons as well, because as you saw, the idea even started as far back as, as this, where the different demi-humans, as they called them at the time, races were limited in their class options. Okay. So if you go back to a game like Chainmail, okay, so this is a war game, one that, that um, preceded D&D. You have these, uh, the fantasy supplement at the end here, and it talks about different troop types, okay? So dwarves and gnomes and elves and fairies are listed as troop types. Those are types of troops that you could have in your game. There's also halflings listed in here as well, the top. Okay, so that is a type of troop. It wasn't an elf fighter or an elf wizard. It was an elf and it had very specific abilities. Okay, then if you look at a game, let's just keep going. Um, this is the game of Dungeon designed by Dave Magari. Now, this game was published by TSR in 1975, so year after D&D came out. But the concept of the game predates D&D. Um, and most folks say it, it started as early as 1972. Okay. So in the game of Dungeon, uh, and Dave McGarry again was a player in Dave Arneson's Blackmore campaign. So the Blackmore game and the Dungeon board game were sort of being, the, or at least the concepts of them, the mechanics were sort of being developed simultaneously, concurrently. Okay. And in the original version of the game of Dungeon, you had four character types that you could play as a player, and they were elf, hero, superhero, and wizard. So again, you were playing an elf. So if you think about what a player character class represents, remember that this it's a role-playing game, but it is a game, and games have rules. And one of the rules that you need to have is like, what can somebody do on their turn? And I know that sounds like it's very mechanical. It's taking away all the narrative and the story-based stuff that you know we associate with role-playing games now. But if you recall when these games were first built, they were built on war games that had very specific things about this is what this person can do on their turn. And elves were different than heroes and superheroes and wizards. They each had different abilities that they bring to the game. Think about the game of chess. You have pawns, you have rooks, you have bishops. OK, you have knights. They all move differently and they all capture their opponent pieces differently. OK, so it's really no different. I know it's sometimes people think it's like taking all the fun out of D&D, but there are rules for a reason. It is a game. OK, so this version of the game is simplifying all of that down into saying, OK, if you want to play a dwarf. So this is the mechanics reason. If you want to play a dwarf, this is what a dwarf can do. OK, and. It just so happens that the dwarf is based on being a fighter with extra goodies, okay? And so what comes of that then is that if you play a dwarf, you actually pay more experience points than you do if you play just a standard fighter, okay? So if you look at this table here, a fighter takes 2,000 experience points to get to level 2, and a dwarf takes 2,200, okay? So the dwarf uses the same hit dice as the fighter and can use the same armor and weapons. Now, dwarves get better saving throws than fighters. That's listed later, but that's one of the advantages of playing a dwarf. They also can detect construction tricks. We talked about that. They have infravision. They have extra languages. And so once you add, they can also find, I think it was room traps. They are expert at finding slanting passages and um, new construction. Okay, so they can do things that other fighters can't do. Okay, so because of that, they pay extra experience points, but that is what their character can do. And for a new player coming into the game, ages 10 and up, remember, then the idea is like giving them fewer options is actually more helpful. It's helping them kind of get used to this idea of this game and not giving them one more thing to worry about. Oh, I can play a dwarf 
but I can also play a dwarf fighter or a thief, but only if my strength is such and such can I go up to the, it's like, it's re, it's eliminating all that. And just say, you want to play a dwarf, play a dwarf. Here you go. Here's how to play it. Here's your experience points. Just let it go. Okay. So elf, same thing, fighter magic user. So that's part of the idea. It's, it's mechanically driven from a simplistic standpoint to help new players understand. So now when I say simple, I don't mean to imply that it is um, not as cool or, or not as, um, you know, workable in an ongoing campaign. So most of you who are watching the channel will know this, but I'm running this version of the game for my daughter and her friends. She's 14. So I admit she has no contact. She's never played any other role playing game to understand that this concept of race as class is, um, is not something that is common in current versions of the game, but like they don't have any problem with that. They're playing an elf. She's playing an elf. And so her elf, uh, you know, is a combo fighter magic user, and that's just how it works. Okay, so, um, but it was easier for her to get into the game because I wasn't giving her this big chunky hardback book and saying, "Here you go." Like, to, you know, to, if you want to play a dwarf in this game, or even if you want to play an elf, I mean, pretty much all you have to read is just that one paragraph I showed you earlier. There's your paragraph on dwarves. You're ready to go. There's your paragraph on elves. Okay, well, it's a few paragraphs, but you see it's, it's a section. It's a very small section here. Okay, so, so much easier for a new player to get to learn. And yet, imagination-wise, this game doesn't hamper your imagination any more than 5e does. Okay, so, um, in fact, I would argue that fewer options leads to more creativity because you don't have... Um, so many different things that you're that you're looking at and then start to limit yourself to only looking at those things. That's a whole other discussion, okay? But that's a mechanics reason for why this is created. Now, let's talk about a lore reason. Well, if you think about uh, the lore of the game, now, right in the beginning, you saw in this version of the game, it said that humans were, you know, most players were gonna be humans. That goes all the way back to, to the original part of the game. Gary has many articles that he writes in Dragon Magazine where he talks about the idea that like in his vision, the game was going to be driven by humans because that is the source material that he read as a kid. So I know a lot of people will make this argument and they'll say, they'll say like, no, he based this game on Tolkien. He did not. OK, he based it on a variety of things. Tolkien was one of them. However, part of the reason that there are so many Tolkien influences in the game wasn't because Gary was obsessed with it. It was because it was so popular at the time. It would have been stupid to not include that. OK, so Gary includes things. Now, obviously, he'd read Tolkien. He'd read Tolkien. It's part of the canon. He lists it in the Appendix N of the Dungeon Master's Guide as being inspirational. So I'm not saying that it wasn't inspirational, but Gary's main source of inspiration was stuff like Conan and Fawford and the Grey Mouser and the John Carter of Marsh. everything where the protagonists are almost always human. Okay, so then from a lore standpoint, by limiting race, uh, limiting class options to race as class. When you limit that, you create these archetypes. So, and, and, and so the idea is that if it's a human dominated world, then the dwarves that most humans see exhibit similar traits because those are the dwarves that are going out and kind of intermingling. Okay. So, um, same with elves. Okay. So elves have a unique place in this game because they, this game does not have multi-classing. So the only multi-class character in this entire game is the elf. They are fighter magic users. So it kind of makes the idea of an elf a little bit more, you know, alien, not from a science fiction standpoint, but again, from comparing it to what is the baseline of, of, of the type of character that you can play in this game. So I know that there's a lot of weighted terms that I'm using here. There is something to be said from the idea from the standpoint of what does this actually mean in terms of how you could reinterpret this in a variety of different ways in, in terms of um you know ongoing discussions of of you know politics or something like that that's not really what i'm talking about here i'm not saying that that isn't a way that you can interpret it but what i'm talking about is from a mechanics reason and then from a lore standpoint having a racist class gives a new player to the game who's never played this before it gives them an instant archetype that they can kind of grab onto and say okay i see dwarves live underground and so they're good at doing things that a person that lives underground would do and they're they're architects they're engineers okay they they're builders so that's why they have those skills halflings 
Okay, in this particular game, they are very much like the wilderness warrior. They get abilities to hide in the undergrowth, but they also can hide in a dungeon. Okay, not as not as good in under in wilderness. It's like a ninety percent chance to hide if they're not moving. Okay, they get bonuses to strike with missile weapons. Um, specifically, um, it was kind of rocks, but that was the idea, and that's taken from the Hobbit. So that is something that's coming out of Tolkien, right? So it's it's crazy because halflings as, as like an archetype don't really have an archetype outside of Tolkien. So the halfling in here is kind of tied to that a little bit. Okay. But dwarves in North in Norse mythology have existed for, you know, a very long time. You also have elves in that. So um, the elf in this is actually a little bit closer to something like an Elric of um, Meldabone from that series from Michael Moorcock. Okay. That kind of fighter magic user combination. So the idea that you have this like one single archetype so that you can say, okay, that's an elf, that's a dwarf. Think of Star Trek, of the original series. Think of Spock. Spock is the quintessential Vulcan. Now, obviously not every Vulcan is like that, but the ones that you see are because that's Spock. He's the one that you see. And so he stands out and he defines what we think of as being Vulcan. There are obviously tons of other Vulcans that live on the whole planet of Vulcan that do all kinds of different things. Not every one of them is a scientist. Okay. But Spock is, and it's kind of like the idea of like, you know, the other races have clerics among their NPCs. You just can't play them as a player. So the idea is the adventuring characters are like the ones in this book. There's probably a whole society that's completely different that has different kinds of things that they can do, but the adventuring ones are like the ones in here. Okay, so Gary, again, is was a big proponent of this idea that the rules should match the milieu, okay? And the demi-human classes he included, he he's quoted as saying this in a few different articles in Dragon Magazine, but like he started to include the different species, the different races or demi-humans as they called them back in the day, um, partly just because, you know, he wanted to appeal to, well, he doesn't say this, but he wanted to appeal to the Tolkien fans. Tolkien um, was very, very popular in the 60s, uh, you know, and especially in the 60s and then the early 70s when Gary was and Dave were developing this game. And uh, especially among college students and college students were the biggest source of players for this type of game. So again, not having them would have not been very smart. Okay. So he includes them in there, but he's very, very careful talking about like, you know, he did throw the half elf in because, you know, he thought, you know, for the, for the sheer madness of the game, or he's, I think there's a quote, something like that. But the idea was he wanted to kind of start limiting it because in his mind, the game was focused more on human protagonists because again, of the source material that he read when he created this game. So by coalescing all those different species down into one race as class option, it, it sort of, again, gives you this, this is the archetype. This is the archetypal elf or ar archetypal dwarf or archetypal halfling, okay? And um, so that is a kind of a lore reason. Now, third, this is probably the biggest reason, um, even though it seems like a small change. But when Gary came out with this game in 1978, Advanced D&D, &D, again, the Monster Man came up the year before, but this is really where they start talking about the classes and stuff. Um, Dave Arneson has left TSR at this point. So he left, I think, in 1976, and he only worked there for a few months. Now, obviously, he helped create all the, you know, this version of the game and things like that. But as far as being employed by TSR, that came in 1976. And then he left because he didn't like the direction it was going. He didn't like what was going on. Um, Gary was much more about codifying rules. And uh, Dave Arneson was more like, you know, it's all it's all up the to the DM to kind of like, we don't need all these rules. The DM kind of just referee things. So, but that means you're not selling stuff, right? If you don't need the rules, you're not, what are you selling? Okay. So, uh, so Dave left and then, um, you know, long story short, there's whole books that you can read about this, but when advanced D&D came out and it's only by Gary Gygax, Gary claimed that this was a separate game. And so he stopped paying, um, or TSR stopped paying Dave Arneson royalties on this game. Now, Dave was still getting royalties on that Holmes Basic set that you saw before. Um, and even that was really muddied because he was only getting royalties on the rule book portion of the set, not on the entire set. That's a whole other thing. Okay. But Dave um, eventually decides to sue TSR um, to get his royalties. And so 
part of TSR's legal standpoint in this was they were saying that this game is a wholly, completely different, separate game from D&D. Okay, so then what you have is then they have to make sure then that this looks very, very different. So if you read this game, there are so many just the minutia of the rules in here, weapon speed factors and weapon versus AC and how the length of your weapon affects when you can attack in combat. And then they break the combat round down into segments, which are like 10 seconds each. And like, what can you do during that segment? Or, or maybe it was one second each, I forget. But anyway, it's breaking it down into like these smaller and smaller components. And the more that you do that, the longer the game's gonna take, the more rules you have. But that was this version of the game. So when people talk about, you know, early D&D was too rules light, definitely not this. This is way more complicated than something like 5e as an example. Okay, if you're used to it, it doesn't seem complicated. But if you're coming into this fresh, there's just a lot in this. So that was part of... I think, especially when you get to the Dungeon Master's Guide, Gary's just adding all this stuff to make this game seem very different. Okay, so then this game, so the basic and expert version of the game, there's an article by Bill Willingham, who is an artist. Uh, you may know him from the Fables comic. He also did the um, uh, the Elementals for Comico. I had a bunch of those as a kid. I love them. But like, see this artwork here, this is by um, Bill Willingham see his signature here. Okay, so he was an artist at TSR. But what happened was um, one of the uh, executives at TSR came to the creative staff and they said, look, we need a new version of the basic game. Because remember that Holmes basic set specifically tells you that if you want to continue on past level three, or if you want to play a demi-human, what they call demi-human thief, you have to refer to advanced Dungeons and Dragons. There's a whole paragraph in that Oops, section talking about referring to advanced D&D. Well, they need to get rid of that because they were trying to make the case that advanced D&D &D was different than the other D&D &D that they were paying Dave Ornest and royalties on. So they scrapped the Holmes basic, they come out with this, and they told the creative team very specifically, make it as different as you can. So there's nothing that is off the table. Increase the character level limits if you want. Uh, change the monsters, add new spells, add like whatever you need to do, make it different. So Bill Willingham addresses that uh, in the article where he talks about what what um, they were directing to do. But like the creative team, like the artists even got in on the creative aspect, like the design aspect. So one of the benefits of changing the race and class dichotomy where you can mix and match into just having race as class, well, benefit of that is that it does make it different from this. It might seem like a small difference, but it is different because uh, a lawyer, you know, an attorney could probably make the case, well, could try to make the case, let's put it that way, that, well, no, this is different because you have all these different race options and then you can pick whatever class you want within reason based on this list here. But if you have, um, uh, if you have uh, this game, you don't get to do that. You're playing a dwarf or an elf or a halfling. You can't choose how to mix and match that, right? So that's a legal reason. So um, again, I think it's probably a combination of all, of all of those. I really do think the simplicity aspect of appealing to a younger, new player with no experience in wargaming is a huge, huge part of it. But a side benefit, again, is this legal aspect and part probably part of the reason why they kept that going. So once Race's class debuts in this version of the game, it continues in the next version of what I'm just going to call it basic because at the time that's what we called it. You had advanced D and D and you had basic. Now, technically this is not called, it's just called dungeons and dragons, but you've got dungeon dragons. You have advanced Dungeons and dragons as kids. Everybody I knew called it. Are you playing advanced or are you playing basic? Okay. So the second version of basic comes out or third version, I should say of basic comes out in 1983. That is the Menser version or commonly called Beck me. It continues racist class. Okay. And then you have, uh, in 1991, you have the release of the Rules Cyclopedia, which is a hardback version of the first four box sets of the Beck Me set. And then you also have the release of the Easy to Master D&D box set, or sometimes called the Black Box. And then in 1994, you have the classic Dungeons & Dragons box set. All of those use race as class. Now, the classic uh, box set, that is the last 
set or of rules that is released for this so-called basic set. But that continues from 94 until TSR is acquired by Wizard of the Coast in 1997. And then, um, and, and, and then in 2000, you have the release of third edition, which gets rid of the two separate you know, concurrent editions of D&D and just collapses it into one. Okay, that's third edition. If any of that's confusing or you just need a refresher, please refer to my video on the history of D&D editions here. It's going to explain all of this to you. Okay, but um, the other thing that though that happened is that once you get into the Beck Me line and then past that, so 83 on and really starting with the release of the Gazetteer series, this was late. Uh, mid to late 80s, I want to say 87, maybe was the first one, could have been 88. But um, you had the release of these different, they were called gazetteers, and these were guides for the different nations in the home setting for this version of the game. So advanced D&D had different settings. You had Greyhawk, you had Dragonlance, you had Forgotten Realms. Those were the main ones during this time period. And then in the 90s, you have this explosion where all these other ones happen. This line, specifically the Beckman line and the ones after, had one setting uh, originally called The Known World, which debuted uh, with an expert module called S, uh, X1. But then uh, later on, it was called Mystara. So if you've ever heard that, that was the world that was designed for this version of the game. So it would use race as class. But one of the things that they did in these gazetteers where they talked about the different nations was say, OK, well, what if you want a dwarf cleric? Here's something you can do. And it just creates a whole new class. So it's not just taking a dwarf and then mixing it with a cleric. It's creating a new class that's a dwarf cleric. And they did this quite a bit. Um, to try to expand the number of options. And so what's really doing is just increasing the number of character classes because you have different demi-human classes, okay? So that was something that the basic line did to try to increase the number of options while not going to the mix and match of race and class that you see in advanced D&D. Okay, so now let's talk about some pros and cons. Well, obviously the cons are, the, the thought is that it really limits. It, it, there's a limit. If I have an idea in my head of a dwarf wizard or you know an elf cleric or something like that, well, I can't do that in this version of the game because uh, I can't. It, the rules don't allow me to do that. So I can't even cast magic as a dwarf in this version of the game. And so there's this thought that it really limits player creativity. And I can see that, especially if you're used to playing a game that does have those options to go, you know, quote unquote, backwards into a game like this, where you don't have that option, uh, it can seem very limiting in terms of your character choice. Okay, so I mean, really, that's, that's the con. Okay, that that's the main thing. It also does imply you know, a lot of people will say, oh, it implies that all elves are the same, all dwarves are the same, there's no differentiation. Okay. And that I can see that argument, but I, I do think it was kind of um, that's part of the design. So again, I'm going to go back to my Star Trek example. If you're looking at this game as something that's driven by humans, if you look at the USS Enterprise from the original series, so don't take any of the other series in account, just go to the original one. Having a Vulcan on the USS Enterprise gives you a lens to view humanity through from a different viewpoint, right? That's why Spock is there. It's to have him use his cultural background to view humanity very differently than we view ourselves. And um, so if you have a ton more of them, then that ceases to to be um, something that that really stands out. OK, so having these like very specific different archetypes is actually a benefit because it helps you have an immediate hook on how to play this type of character. And just to drive the Star Trek, uh, you know, analogy further. So once you get into something like DS9, where you have all these different uh, different um, races uh, and species on on the plant on the station on the space station. So Odo is the point of view, like Spock or Data character on that show. That's that's who he is. But look at Kira Nerys, a Bajoran. Okay, so great character. She's very cool. But there's nothing about the way that that character is written that really gets into her how her viewpoints as a Bajoran differ from a human. Now, she's got the spirituality aspect of it, which humans in that that day and age didn't have in Star Trek. But when you really look at it, there's if that character had been made a human and just said she grew up in a human refugee camp, there's no difference to how that character's played. And that's something that happens the more you start to add more and more options and more and more different races and species to a game. 
So that's something that's a bit of a complaint about modern Star Trek. And again, just the, the reason I keep harping on Star Trek is because I think it's a it's a very relevant analogy. So the more the series go on, especially in that kind of next gen era, era, the more the alien species basically become humans with head ridges, forehead ridges. There's there's very little to differentiate them. So on the USS Enterprise from Star Trek Next Generation, you've got um, Data, who again, is, that's our point of view character to kind of view humanity through his lens and what we're doing and how he looks at it. But you've got Worf, the Klingon. Now, there's some interesting things about Worf, but it's all cultural based. It's not really based on the fact that he's an alien. He's just from a different culture. So that and that that's a trap to fall into. And it's very easy to because we're all humans. So we can only think of how we would view things as a human, right? So anytime you're playing a non-human or you're you're writing a non-human for a screenplay or a movie or you're seeing that, any of those are going to come down to it's limited by what our experiences of as humans are. So I think it's extremely difficult to play a non-human race in a D&D game. Uh, I think it can be fun and I do it I do it quite a bit, but I always do have this kind of perception as I'm talking and I'm playing that I'm really just playing a human with the stack of little benefits. And and that is a way a lot of people do approach it, right? It's not approached from the standpoint of of wanting to play um a particular race because of of its culture. It's playing it because of the benefits that you get in stacking them with different things. And that's a fine way to play if you're into that, that kind of system mastery and that min-maxing, then yeah, definitely just just go for that. But I, I do think it does kind of impact it. So my point of all that being a, a pro of this kind of system where you don't have to worry about any of that, like what's the best, you know, which multi-class option and feet and all this stuff should I take to stack with my dwarf to get the best benefit? You don't worry about that because you are playing a dwarf. Okay. And then how you choose to play that dwarf is up to you, but you're going to play to its strengths because it has certain things that it does better than others. So that is, um, those are just some of the pros and cons. I would love to hear your versions of pros and cons. Uh, so please put them in the comments below. Um, again, I'm running this game for my daughter. And what I think is fun about it is, um, I mean, a lot of things are fun about it, of course. But it, what's fun about the idea of race and as class is that, again, it really helps to define what are the key aspects that these races are known for as they're mingling together? It also helps to explain why, and, and I think that people will say this all the time, like if elves are so long lived, if they're so long lived, then why can't they advance to unlimited levels of magic use, for example, like a human can. Now, of course, in 5e and, you know, that that's not an option or that's not a problem, right? But in this version of the game, this version of the game, elves are limited to how far that they can advance in their, um, in whatever class that they are. Okay. And that was a balancing thing that was done from a mechanics standpoint. So all of the races and classes uh, well, races specifically in this game, the races class, and then in this game, they're all front loaded. Everything that an elf gets or a dwarf gets, an elf can do fighting and magic use, gets um, infravision, can detect secret doors, is immune to ghoul paralysis, and they get all these extra language. They get all that at first level. Okay. So they, they get a leg up on humans. Same with dwarves, right? Dwarves have the infravision, they have the extra languages, they detect the secret passages, they have better saving throws. Okay, and all that happens at first level. So the balancing factor is one, cost you more experience points. We talked about that earlier. The other part of the balance is they can only advance so far. They stop at a certain level, they're capped. And part of that, from a lore standpoint, if you're trying to like retcon why those mechanics exist, part of that lore reason is because these races sort of they hold themselves apart. They become so insular that they're focusing on just certain things to the exclusion of everything else. Whereas humans are adaptable. It talks about this in here. And that is your benefit of playing a human. Mechanically, the benefit that humans get playing any class they want and advancing in level as far as they want to. Okay. So when you have that as your benefit of humans, then you need to do something to make a player say, well, why wouldn't I play one of these other races when they get everything a human gets plus more? Well, they don't get everything a human gets. And so the idea being like, you've got these adventuring demi-humans, but then you've got like this, these versions of the game, almost always, like, you know, even if you look at some, like if you look at the world of Mystara or the world of Greyhawk, there's all these, like, here's the Dwarven kingdom, here's the Elven nation. And it's sort of like, they kind of just keep to themselves. 
and they're separating themselves. So again, there could be all kinds of different things happening with the elves that live in their own elven nation, but you're not going to experience them because you're probably never going to see them. You're never going to meet them. So, um, so then the idea is that then there's really no reason for them to focus on things to get better at things that make you better at adventuring because they're not doing that. So I, I know it's kind of hard to explain, but, um, the idea is that, you know, you mechanically, you need to make sure in these versions of the game that demi humans are different from humans. Now, as you get into later versions of the game, perhaps it was a more elegant solution to just give humans extra stuff. Um, but if you look at something like third edition, you know, all the different races get extra goodies, right? At first level that humans really don't get. And so then they balanced it by giving humans an extra feat. Okay. So that's a different system of balance. It's just different from this. So again, pros and cons, and I would love to hear your, your um, explanation or your thoughts on the pros and cons of playing racist class, because I know it's an extremely foreign concept to people that haven't encountered this in the game before. So uh, that's all I have for this particular video on race as class. So uh, if you like this video, I would love to ask if you could please give it a like. And also if you could subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so yet. And if you could share my video on your social media networks to help me grow my channel, I would really, really appreciate it. Again, please drop into the comments and let me know what you thought about uh, what you think of the concept of race as class. If you use it, if you would ever even consider trying it, or, um, you know, I, I suspect a lot of people that don't didn't grow up with this version of the game are going to say, like, no, that doesn't sound like it's for me. And I get that. But, like, tell me, you know, why I would love to I would love to hear why. And uh, hopefully my explanations made sense as to kind of like why I like it in the games that I run uh, in some of the games that I run, at least. So also below when you're leaving a comment, um, you can find places where you can join me on uh, social media. You can find me on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. I'm on Blue Sky. Uh, you'll also find links where you can help support my channel by buying something from my shop, like a t-shirt, hoodie, mug, poster, something like that. I have all these different designs that I worked with an artist friend to help me create and also just kind of to clean up. There, I have certain designs of um, basically the dice patents. So all these different dice that we use in the game, these types of dice, at a certain point, people had to patent those. And so you, uh, I've got the patents and uh, worked with an artist to help um, basically uh, clean them up because they're in very, very low res. And I clean them up and you can get a patent design for those, which would make a fun, you know, thing that you could put in like a game room or something like that, like a poster of the D20 patent as an example. Okay, so you can find all that below. And then um, whenever you buy from that, then it helps me put um, more back into the channel. Again, I'm hoping to upgrade my camera, my microphone, things like that to kind of help the videos be a little bit more consistent from a technical standpoint. So right now I'm just using my phone and transferring it to my laptop. That's that's literally what I'm doing. So um, with all that uh, said, I would like to say thank you so very much for watching. Happy gaming, stay safe, and I will talk to you next time. And now for the bonus content. This is what I was drinking and what I was listening to while I was working on my notes for this particular video. So this is um, some rum. My dad gave this to me for my birthday a few years ago, and I still have a little bit left. So this is Blackwell Fine Jamaican Rum 007 uh, Limited Edition. So they called it 007 because um, uh, Ian Fleming wrote some of the um, James Bond books novels in uh in jamaica okay and some of them actually take place there some of the stories take place there so this is a limited edition my dad got one for me and one for him and uh so i don't know i don't drink a lot of rum so i just kind of thought you know i'd mix it up a little bit show you something a little bit different so mm -hmm. on the nose it's kind of that um it's it's very um there's like orange there's a little bit of tobacco maybe some allspice and um, it's very dry for a rum. It's not, I mean, it's sweet, but it's not as sweet as some. And um, I think it's a very good sipping rum. So, you know, I only have just a little tiny bit. I'm not, you know, guzzling a tumbler or anything like that. So, uh, but it also makes good cocktails. I've mixed cocktails uh, with this rum before. Now, listening wise, I was listening to Duke Ellington and John Coltrane. I just love, love, love this album. So the famous Elvin Jones on drums. So, uh, if you know anything about jazz, so Duke Ellington is one of the original guys like coming out in kind of like the thirties, uh, that big band style, a very famous composer, so many songs that he wrote. And 
this is now later in his career. Uh, and he is playing here again with John Coltrane. So John Coltrane was kind of like the new upstart, had a very different sound. Uh, they called, they referred to it as the sheets of sound, the way that he played the saxophone. He played so many notes so fast and, um, it really kind of took the world by storm. So most famously, other than his solo work, he played in with Miles Davis and um, one of the famous uh, Miles Davis groups uh, that did the kind of blue album, did a couple others with him as well. But the first great quintet, uh, Coltrane was part of that. So, um, and then he left that band and kind of came back. But anyway, this album, it's kind of, so you have sort of like this elder statesman in, in the form of, of Duke Ellington uh, on piano, of course. And then with this sort of like young upstart, like one of the new young rebel types uh, that was redefining what we think of as jazz. And um, it's just a great combination. And particularly this lead off track. If you just listen to one song off here, put, look it up on Spotify or something in a sentimental mood, uh, just the, the, the 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 interplay between Ellington's piano and Coltrane's saxophone. Um, my daughter is fourteen. I'm gonna talk. She loves this song. She listens to it almost every night when she goes to bed. She listens to it on her, um, you know, uh, enabled speaker. I'm not gonna say what it's called because I've got one in my office here and it'll pop off. Okay, so that's this album. Highly recommend if you can check it out. Uh, give it a give it a chance, and uh, please be on the lookout for uh, an upcoming video. Next week, so this is the week of, uh, well, Mar uh, it's the week of September 25th, 2023. So next week, the week of October 2nd, I'll be releasing a video, probably another campaign prep video. So be please be on the lookout for that. And if you could please watch it and share it, because again, those don't typically, typically do as well as these history videos that uh, like the one I just did. And then um, if you could uh, check out one of these other videos here that I show, uh, I would really appreciate it. Thanks, and I'll talk to you soon.